Okay, so this is a cool discussion because it'll sort of be like a little bit of a shock. And I like those discussions that shock you a little bit because it means that something completely new and the only challenge is to recognize that it's something that you already knew just in a different context. That's the power of linear algebra. So some time ago, I think last week, we discussed symmetric matrices. And we discovered some magical properties of symmetric matrices. Number one, nothing can go wrong when you're doing eigenvalue analysis of symmetric matrices. You will not have complex eigenvalues. You will not have defective eigenvalues. You will always have a complete set of eigenvalues. In an n-dimensional, for an n by n matrix, you will have n eigenvalues and n corresponding eigenvectors. And those eigenvectors will be either already orthogonal if they correspond to eigenvalues that are distinct, or they can be chosen to be orthogonal if those eigenvalues are identical. Okay. Also we discovered maybe an even more magical property. Well, no, I'm sorry. I already mentioned both of them. I wanted to mention real and orthogonal eigenvectors. So I already, met, I already mentioned both of them. Now in the other class, and if you're not in my PDE's class, no problem. I'll sort of remind you of what the Laplacian is. We're discussing the Laplacian all the time. And we've discovered that its eigenvalues always seem to be negative. Haven't we discovered that? The, the Laplace eigenvalues are always negative. And it also seems to always, we always seem to come up with uh, perfectly nice eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. And not only that, in so many cases there are sines and cosines, which, when we were discussing the Fourier series in this class, we discovered were orthogonal. So the Laplacian seems to have real eigenvalues, always negative, and the corresponding eigenvectors are orthogonal. So doesn't the Laplacian kind of strike you by that property as a symmetric operator, and by symmetric I mean all eigenvalues are always real, and also negative definite, because eigenvalues seem to be negative. Or, you know, yes, that's what we've discovered. They're always negative. So there's great temptation to find the linear algebra reason for it. And it has got to have to do something with the Laplacian being a symmetric operator. Now let me remind you of what the Laplacian is. The Laplacian, there's a long discussion of why this is not such a great definition, but let's just stick with this one. In Cartesian coordinates, it's the sum of second derivatives. So a part that's not controversial is that, yes, we can think of it as a linear operator. It is linear. A linear operator on the space of functions. And so we can ask the question of its eigenvalues. The question of its eigenvalues will be this. The Laplacian of what function equals a multiple of that function? And that question can be asked on a segment from 0 to 1, one dimension, in which case the Laplacian is simply the second derivative with respect to x and nothing else. Or you can ask it on a complicated two-dimensional domain. So we can consider this problem in one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, n dimensions. And in all cases, we'll restrict ourselves to the case of zero boundary conditions. Now that sounds like PDE talk. So to translate it into linear algebra terms, I will tell you to consider the subspace of functions whose values are zero at either end. Isn't that a linear subspace? Isn't it true that if I take two functions whose values at the boundary, at the two endpoints, equals zero, that a sum of two functions like that is another function like that? Of course it is. And if I multiply it by a number, is it once again a function of the same kind? Yes, it is. So yes, it's a linear subspace. The same thing in two dimensions. If I restrict my attention only to functions that equal zero on the boundary, usually denoted by s, do they form a linear subspace? And the answer is 
Yes, they do. Add, take two functions like that, add them together, another function like that. Take one of them, multiply it by a number, another function like that. Closure under linear combinations, thus a subspace. And so on that particular subspace, I can ask the question of the, carefully, there are some important caveats that I'm still thinking about, of the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator. And if we think just about this one right here, we'll discover that they all, all have the form sine of pi x. Nope. <laughs> sine of n pi x. Do you guys see that these are the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator? The Laplace operator in one dimension is just the second derivative. Let's make sure of that. Take two derivatives of this function and you will get, will you get a multiple of that function back? Yes. What is that multiple? Negative n squared pi squared. Do you guys see that? And so yes, all of the eigenvalues are negative. And you will also find that all of these signs are actually orthogonal to each other with respect to this inner product. With respect to this inner product, all of these signs are orthogonal to each other. So yes, the second derivative operator, or generalized to higher dimensions, the Laplace operator, has the property that its eigenfunctions, if we restrict our attention to the ones that equal zero on the boundary, their eigenfunctions are orthogonal, and all of the eigenvalues are negative. The same thing will be the case here. And so you want to be able to say that the Laplacian is a negative definite symmetric operator. But what in the world does it mean for an operator to be symmetric? How can you make sense of it? And here's how you make sense of it. Let's think back to symmetric matrices and think back to the argument that proved that the eigenvectors are orthogonal. Do you remember that argument? I'll give you a slightly different form of that argument. Essentially, I'll maybe do it, I'll do it right here. Essentially, they, if we said, let's look at the combination X transpose AY, where X and Y are the eigenvectors corresponding to the different eigenvalues. Do you remember that? And it essentially said, we can look at this product two different ways. One way to look at it, let's start with this one first, is to group it like this and to look at AY and of course that was lambda 2Y, it was the second eigenvalue times Y and when you multiply it by X transpose you end up with lambda 2 X transpose Y. Alternatively you can group it this way and what we have here is A multiplying X, right? Because this equals A X transpose. Am I right? And why did I not write A transpose? Because A is symmetric. We're dealing with a symmetric matrix. So the beauty of having a symmetric matrix is that you can group it like this and then it's operating on Y. Or you can group it like this and then it's the same matrix, not, not its transpose but it's the same matrix operating on X. And when it operates on X, we get lambda one X. And so here we end up with lambda one X transpose Y. And because these are two different ways of looking at the same thing and they're equal, because lambda one is not equal to lambda two, we have to conclude that X transpose Y equals zero. In other words, X is orthogonal to Y. You remember that argument? Okay, and this is the key to carrying over this idea to the concept of functions. This is how, at least in my head, this happened historically. People looked at this and noticed this wonderful property, and then they said, well, how do we generalize it to functions and other sorts of things? And they said, well, the key to this argument 
and actually to the proof that the eigenvalues are real, which we'll do when we're talking about complex variables probably next week, complex numbers, was this being able to act on either, on either side, on the left or the right. So you can interpret this in two ways. Let me put it in a slightly different way. When A is symmetric, forget about eigenvalues. When A is symmetric, this can be interpreted in two different ways. On the one hand, this could be X dotted with AY, right? Because when you multiply X transpose by some vector, it's, it's, dot product, it's, dot, it's dotting with respect to the standard inner product. So you can think of this in a product, excuse me, this matrix product as X dotted with AY, which is nice because there's no transpose here. That's why pure linear algebraists, maybe, uh, like this over this. Or it can be interpreted as AX dotted with Y, right? So you can either put A on Y or you can put A on X. And because A is symmetric, it doesn't matter which one you put it on. But because in this way of speaking, I'm only using the term in a product and linear transformation. That presents a generalization to arbitrary linear spaces and arbitrary in a product. You call a function, excuse me, you call a linear transformation self-adjoint. This can only happen in the presence of an inner product. If there are no inner products, there you cannot even talk about self-adjoint operators. Just like I said before, the very concept of a symmetric matrix, the very concept of the transpose only arises when you're doing dot products. Until then, you can do eigenvalues, you can do linear systems, never arises. The same thing with the term self-adjoint transformation. Never arises unless there is an inner product because it corresponds to the concept of a symmetric matrix. So if you have an inner product and some transformation, let me call it T. Let me call it T. And if you have X and you have Y, and you have X and you have Y, and if it doesn't matter whether you apply it to X or whether you apply it to Y prior to the dot product, then the transformation T is called self-adjoint. From this I can talk about what the adjoint is, but we can skip that. I think the really interesting part is the self-adjoint transformations. Okay, so if the transformation is such that it doesn't matter which, which of the two vectors in a dot product of, of an inner product you apply it to, then the transformation is called self-adjoint. And then by using the exact same argument as we did here, except instead of saying X transpose AY, you say the inner product of AX and Y or TX and Y, you can use the exact same argument. I'm not even going to repeat it to show that if a matrix is self-adjoint, then its eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other with respect to that same inner product. You can see it, I'm not gonna repeat it. And you can use the same argument that we'll use in a, in a, little, in a little while when we do complex numbers to show that all of its eigenvalues are real. And that's the beauty of linear algebra. You notice something in one particular vector space, in this case Rn, and you just using the inner product, you generalize it to any vector space at all. And so, to now prove the observation that all of the eigenvalues, all of the eigen, uh, okay, eigenvalues of the Laplacian are real, and all of its eigenfunctions are orthogonal, all I need to do is to show, is to prove that the Laplacian is a self-adjoint transformation. So the moment I prove that, I get these properties for free. And then in the course of that proof, there will also be a proof that it's, that it's negative definite. 
and therefore proves that all of the eigenvalues are negative. And you get all of that for free. If you were taking a class in partial differential equations and you just saw that argument, you might think that it's a property of, that it's a partial differential equations discussion. It's not at all. It is the purest form of linear algebra. And it showcases the appeal of linear algebra. That sort of, you do it once, and it applies to so many fields, so many fields of mathematics all at once.